Easter morning, 1973, and I, this is a very special day in my life. Uh, it, it's the, I know it's not on the same date every year, but it commemorates the anniversary of when I stepped down an aisle at Madeira Drive Baptist Church in Orange Park and gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of six. That doesn't mean that the journey hasn't been long and winding, and, and uh, I have made more than my share of mistakes, but because He has risen, we have an eternal hope, amen? amen? We are forgiven because of His defeat of sin, death, and hell, both through His sacrificial death on Calvary's cross and His victorious uh, resurrection from the dead. We have hope. And we have peace. And he has given us everything we need to, to live this life in victory and to, to have everlasting life in heaven once this time on earth is over. And we have so much to be thankful for. I hope this morning as Easter uh, is upon us that it will be a day of resurrection for you. Perhaps you've never believed that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. Or perhaps you're a believer, but in the doldrums spiritually, and you need a new life. You need a fresh breath of God's presence in, in your situation. Today could be your day to have your spirit resurrected as well. And that's my prayer for each and every one of us, that as we worship the Lord today, His Holy Spirit would inhabit the praise of His people this morning, and He will resurrect our spirits so that we may be faithful in being people of the resurrection in our everyday life. Amen? Amen. We want to welcome you here. If you're a guest today, we want to say thank you so much for worshiping with us. Uh, those joining us online, we welcome you as well. And we are so thankful to be able to celebrate the risen Savior. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and thank you that we can gather together as your people to worship you. Again, Lord, if there is anyone here who has never trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray that today... They would hear the invitation that you have extended to them afresh and anew, that if anyone will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Lord, I know from, from your word that, and we know that it's not your will that any should perish. So we pray, God, for souls to be saved today. Lord, we pray for those who believe, who need a resurrected, rejuvenated spirit Lord, I pray that we will rise from the ashes of difficult circumstances and, set our, and that you will set our feet once again upon the rock of your truth, your word, your presence. Lord, that you would empower us with your spirit so that we may be faithful servants. And God, may your gospel go forth today, Lord, and may people be transformed. We love you, Lord, and you are the object of our worship. We are here to adore, worship, and celebrate the matchless name of Jesus, our resurrected, risen Savior. It's in his matchless name I pray. Amen. Well, as we consider the resurrection, as we think about the single most important event in all of human history, I, I had someone want to take issue with that statement one, one Sunday uh, at, at a previous church, they said, no, the crucifixion is the single uh, most important uh, event. And, and I said, you know, the crucifixion was absolutely critical because it was there that Christ paid for our sins through his suffering, through his blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And that, the person quoted that verse to me, and I said, but I want you to think about something. If Jesus had stayed dead, if the resurrection had never happened, we would not have eternal life. The reason is, Jesus would have just been a martyr. 
He would have been a martyr for a cause. And, and we as Christians wouldn't be different from any other world religion because we would worship a good man who died. But because Jesus is risen, he displayed the power of God. He displayed his sovereignty over death. Because of Jesus, because of the resurrection, death has no sting. Because Jesus Christ defeated death for you. And so it's the resurrection, my dear friend, that makes all the difference. Yes, we have an empty cross, but it's only empty because we know he rose again. We have not only have an empty cross, we also have an empty tomb. And we celebrate the risen Savior today. 1 Corinthians 15 is an incredible chapter where Paul argues for the centrality of the resurrection in Christianity. And I wanted to share with you and have us read together three verses from 1 Corinthians 15. Would you please stand with me in honor of God's word this morning? This is why the resurrection matters. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Notice that man is capitalized. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. If you've been made alive in Christ this morning because you've trusted him as your Savior, say amen. Amen Amen and hallelujah. What a Savior. I invite uh, you to be seated for just a moment. As I share a quick story with you about Easter, author Margaret Sangster Phippen wrote that in the mid-1950s, her father, a former British general and then a minister in the British government, began to notice some uneasiness in his throat and a dragging in his leg. He went, when he went to the doctor, he found that he had an incurable disease that would cause a progressive muscular atrophy. His muscles would gradually waste away. His voice would fail. His throat would soon become unable to swallow. Sangster threw himself into his work in in British home missions because, you see, he was also a devout Christian. Figuring he could still write and he could he would have even more time for prayer. He said, let me stay in the struggle, Lord, he pleaded. I don't mind if I no longer can be a general, but give me just a regiment to lead. He wrote articles and books and helped organize prayer cells throughout England. I'm only in the kindergarten of suffering, he told people who stopped to have pity on him. Gradually, Sangster's legs became useless. His voice completely failed. But when he could still hold a pen, he he could write shakily. And on Easter morning, just a few weeks before he died, he wrote a letter to his daughter. Listen to what he said. It is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice to shout, He is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. I pray that this morning you will have a voice to praise the Lord. And you have an opportunity to do that just now. Let's watch a quick video that talks a little bit more about Easter.
invite our worship team to come lead us as we worship. Happy Easter, everyone. How are we doing today? All right, so starting off our worship this morning, we are going to be singing Crown Him with Many Crowns. Yeah. 
domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. As we continue throughout the month, month of April, we will be collecting the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Those envelopes are there uh, in, your, uh, in your pew rack for you to use. Um, the uh, motto or the theme this year is United Called to Be One. Let's watch a video explaining more about a missionary and their ministry. When people say keep Portland weird, you can think oh, people there want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the gospel, but there are so few evangelicals in the city that uh, that curiosity is like you're this exotic creature. Most people have never met a pastor before. And so you're definitely the minority if you are a Christian. Gresham Bible Church was the first church I planted. We developed lots of deep, meaningful friendships with people in that community and our kids did as well but three years ago the lord made it clear to us that there were other communities in portland that needed a new healthy church this particular area of northeast portland is what you might call a, a church desert and we were excited to follow the, the call of god but worried about how our kids would take the news yeah i was not thrilled that we were moving like one of the big things that we had been praying for when we moved here was that I could find some friends in this neighborhood and I found a lot, so that's really nice. We put ourselves out there in all kinds of ways with neighbors and with people who heard about this new church getting started and it is all hands on deck for the Brown family in this church plant. It's been a while since I went to church and just sat and listened instead of doing stuff during it, but it's nice to be able to help. We've got to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ grow. We've seen leaders raised up and missionaries sent out from our church because the need for gospel access in this city is really great. We started this church believing the Lord would provide and they've got to see, wow, God gave us a building and God brought people and... I'm sorry, it's gonna make me cry. They get a front row seat, you know, to see the Lord provide and it's been really awesome really awesome. Amen. And 100% of the money that you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering goes directly to missionaries like the Browns serving in what they describe there as a church desert where there are so many lost people, so few gospel witnesses, and uh, we love the, the fact here at Good News that we get to support them financially, support them through our prayers. Our church goal this year is $800. And would you consider how the Lord would have you give uh, to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering? You'll have the opportunity to give in just a few moments during our offering time.
At this time, I'd like to invite Brother Chris uh, to bless us with a song this morning. Good morning. Well, even though Mom and uh, Granny couldn't be here, I figured I'd honor them with uh, some of my heritage, and I'm going to sing uh, a song called Who Am I, uh, originally sung by Elvis Presley. So. Amen.
from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Of our 
praise. Let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God, you lay down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice. Jesus, Son of God, Jesus, Son of God. Also known as anastasis. I just wanted to share. I just wanted to share with y'all what anastasis means. I actually looked up the definition, and basically, what anastasis means is resurrection. So, Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave. Amen. Amen. And O praise the name is the story of what he went through death on the cross, being down in the grave, and rising again. And he is coming back. Amen. 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 So let's sing Anastasis together. My 
Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they lay him down in Joseph's Can you, till that day where we're all the saints are gathered around the throne of God, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more suffering of any kind, because our faith will finally be made sight. And all that's possible, dear friend, because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is ascended, seated at the right hand of the Father, and He is coming again. We have so much to be thankful for as believers, and now we have that opportunity to give back to God what He has called us to. This is your time to be a faithful giver. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you with all of our hearts for the privilege of being your children. Now, Lord, as we respond to you with obedience, out of love, out of joy that you have so richly given us because of your sacrificial death and glorious resurrection, your perfect life, Lord, you gave us the consummate example of what it is to be a servant while we're here on earth. And Lord, these funds and able servants, both here from this church as well as your missionaries throughout the globe to continue their ministry. So Lord, we pray that you will bless this time of giving, that you may be glorified and your kingdom may continuously be expanded through lives being transformed by the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come now and bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord. doxology. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. While you're turning there, I want you to think about something this morning. The power of an invitation. You know, a lot of us enjoy parties. But some are by invitation only. Now, there was even a movie in Hollywood about party crashers. But most people who come to a party were invited. 
power of an invitation is great. I think about high school graduates that send out invitations announcing their graduation, knowing that the people that receive them probably, especially if they're out of state, will not be able to come to the graduation, but they certainly hope that person will at least send them a gift. The power of an invitation. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead is an invitation for you to receive the greatest gift that's ever been offered. The gift of salvation. Because as I briefly mentioned earlier, salvation, if salvation was just comprised over Jesus' sacrificial death, Again, he would have just been a martyr for a cause. But Jesus claiming to be God in saying things like, I am the resurrection and the life. When he rose Lazarus from the dead. He was declaring, I'm different. I'm unique. I am the monogenes, the one-of-a-kind Savior of the world. One-of-a-kind. One of there has never been, there never will be, any other like Jesus. And His resurrection from the dead makes Him unique, one-of-a-kind, the only Lord, only Savior, only Redeemer. Who can make sinful man right with a holy God. Last Sunday we looked at the suffering of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. As he was pressed emotionally, physically, spiritually from every conceivable angle all at once. He allowed himself to be pressed like those Olives, where the oil flows out. Except from Jesus, the oil of salvation flowed into a lost world. But now, dear friend, as we just sang about, low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord, up from the grave, he arose. You know, the resurrection of Christ was the miracle of miracles. I want you to consider this. Without it, there really is no Savior, just a martyr. There's no hope of heaven. Our faith, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, would be empty. And among all men, Christians should be the most pitied if there was no resurrection. Because we are just worshiping lies. But as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, but indeed Christ has risen from the dead. There would be no salvation. Death would be the end. The people who deny Christ, who claim that we evolved from pond scum, from single cell organisms, up through primates, and then finally into what we are today. All of them who claim that once you die, you die, and that's it. There's no heaven. There's no eternity. It's just death and emptiness. Without the resurrection, dear friend, they would be absolutely right. But it's the resurrection that makes all the difference. And this morning, my prayer is that the resurrection is your difference. The difference for you personally today. So this morning, we're going to be taking a look at the first three interactions that Jesus had once he rose from the dead in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 30, we'll see his interaction with Mary Magdalene. We'll see his interaction with his disciples. And then we'll see 
his interaction with one of his disciples who wasn't there the first time, a man affect, not so affectionately remembered as Doubting Thomas. But in these three interactions, I want to, I want to submit to you this morning that there are seven invitations of the resurrected Savior. And I pray that this morning you will receive those invitations from Him and the gift of salvation. And if you are already saved, I pray that you will receive the gift of spiritual renewal, spiritual resurrection, that you may be may remember this morning that you have been made new in Christ and that He's called you and that He's equipped you to serve Him out of love and faithfulness. Let's take a look at these first, these seven invitations of the risen Christ spoken on that first Easter morning and then seek to make personal application from the words that Jesus spoke to our own lives. Let's read this powerful passage, John chapter 20, verses 11 through 30. Please stand in honor of God's word. Wanted to read the whole passage this morning so you get the full context of each of these three interactions. Here we go. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. He called her by name. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord! And she told them that He had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. By the way, folks, that's you and I. 
Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Thank you. You can be seated. In these three vital times of interaction, Jesus gives us seven different invitations. The first is found there in verse 15. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Some of you are living a life of emptiness and sorrow. I want to ask you, who is it that you're looking for? What do you expect from this life in a world full of sin, full of hatred, or of animosity, anger, resentment, tears, are part of life? But I want to ask you again, who is it? That you're looking for today. Do you think. That some relationship with another person. Is going to deliver you. From this feeling of emptiness. I have been married. To the person that I consider. The greatest individual. In the history of the world. And I love her. With every fiber of my being. But I will tell you this. That there's still pain. There's still tears. We've been married for 36 years. And yet, we still get angry. And yes, we still argue. None of that has been taken away. There is great joy in relationships. But it's not joy that lasts for eternity. There's not peace that surpasses all understanding that you will ever find in relationships with someone else. Do you try to find healing from your sorrow, from your grief, from your despair, through addictive substances? You'll only find emptiness and pain. Trust me, I tried it. And there is no healing in the bottom of a bottle, whether that's a bottle of booze or a bottle of pills. There's no healing found. Because whatever euphoria you experience is only temporary. And you're risking your long-term health by engaging in addictive behaviors that only destroy. Jesus gave Mary Magdalene a permanent invitation to be healed from her tears. She went from crying at the tomb of Jesus to shouting, I have seen the Lord! And I want any of you to know this morning that need to be healed, that healing is only found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say something to you. Because Satan uses every opportunity to turn you away from believing in Christ. You may have people in your life that claim to be Christians that continue to live like the world. You may have people who are inconsistent witnesses for Christ. But I want to remind you of something. They're sinners just like you are. And, and holding up people as examples is a dangerous way to live. But when you, as Scripture tells us in Hebrews, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, it is He who will bring you not only healing in heaven, but emotional and spiritual healing here. Some of you are struggling with chronic diseases 
that you've been praying for healing for and you have not found healing this side of heaven. But the Bible promises us that eventually you will be healed, if not here, in heaven. But if you are in need of healing today, I want to ask again, who is it you're looking for? There's not a prescription in the world that can heal you. There's not a person in the world that can bring you the peace you're searching for. It's only found in the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary's weeping. Think of the tears through the years that you've shed. Tears would have never been a part of life if there had been no sin. Have you ever thought about that? Even Jesus wept over the unbelief of his own people. Here Jesus stands on resurrection ground and asks Mary and asks you, why are you weeping? He may not take all the tears away in this life, but in Revelation 21.4, the Bible proclaims, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, what's also interesting here is that Mary did not recognize the Lord. Perhaps it was through the, the prism of her tears falling. Maybe it was the early time of day or the shadows. It could have even been the close of that day, which typically people would have been hooded to protect their, their head from sun and wind and rain and weather. But you know what? I doubt it was for any of those reasons that Mary didn't recognize Jesus. I believe she didn't recognize Jesus because she simply wasn't looking for him. She was looking for a dead body, not a resurrected Savior. If you are in need of healing today, may you accept the invitation of the Lord. And stop focusing on death and start living in the newness of life that a resurrected Savior can bring you. When you live in sin, you're drowning in a chasm of death and separation from God. The Savior offers you an invitation today to be healed. Not only do we see a an invitation to be healed, but we also have an invitation to hear. I want you to notice Jesus called Mary by name. She thought he was the gardener. Until he said, Mary. And that voice that she had heard so many times from her rabbi, her teacher, her savior. At that, Mary recognized Jesus. Those who love the Lord know his voice. He says in John, my sheep hear my voice and they know, that, they know it and they follow me. Will you hear the Savior call you by name this morning? Perhaps he's calling you by name to be saved. To accept his sacrifice and resurrection from the dead. Perhaps he's calling you by name to be restored into a right relationship with him. Through repentance, through confession, through you falling on, on your knees and prostrating yourself before him. Asking for forgiveness so that you might be restored. Perhaps he's calling you by name to enter into a new ministry. Perhaps he's calling you by name to simply trust him. 
whatever he's calling you by name for, will you respond? Because he gives you, just like he gave Mary, an invitation to hear and recognize his voice. You know, it's interesting that Scripture tells us that Jesus knew people after he resurrected, and so will we. Moses and Elijah knew Christ and each other on the Mount of Transfiguration. And I believe that we will know each other in heaven based upon this biblical evidence. Our relationships will be different in heaven. There will be no marriage or being given in marriage. But we will recognize each other. And those who love the Lord most will receive an incredible blessing. Because they will see Jesus. Based upon their salvation, based upon their walk with Him, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon His face. What a day. Will you hear the Lord call you by name today? So we have an invitation to be healed, an invitation to hear. And next, we have an invitation to be His heralds. He tells Mary in verse 17, Don't hold on to me. Instead, go to my brothers and tell them. And she goes and she declares, I have seen the Lord. And then the disciples are, are, in, uh, in, are, are ecstatic and they try to tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And then later on, there in verse 21, Jesus says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Notice in this passage The disciples, even after Mary declared that she had seen the Lord, they hadn't seen Him yet. Their doors were still locked. They were still in fear of Roman authorities coming to arrest them. But when Jesus appears and He says, Peace be with you, I am sending you, eleven cowards were turned into hot-hearted witnesses for the Lord. What about you? Are you so afraid of what other people might think that you don't tell anybody about Jesus? Are your spiritual doors locked and your spiritual windows battened down? You feel like you have to worship in a holy huddle so that nobody will see. Are you bold in telling people that Jesus loves them? Brother Tracy and on his mail route yesterday, shared a picture uh, of a young man on a curb with a sign that says, Jesus loves you, somewhere near Ocala, I believe. If a young man on Easter Saturday can hold a sign and tell people, drive strangers driving by in a car that Jesus loves them, what can you and I do? To be the herald, the witness that the Lord Jesus Christ desires for us to be. We have the greatest message ever known. Jesus saves. He's risen. He's coming again. I believe. Will you? Because I want you to come with me to heaven. I want you to know Jesus and allow Him to transform your life just like He's changed mine. We have a message. The cross and and the resurrection give us an amazing message of power. And we have the Holy Spirit in us to help us deliver it. Are we going to tell it? Or are we going to keep it to ourselves? What if Mary had never told the disciples we have seen the Lord? Sure, you can say Jesus would have appeared to them anyway, but what kind of a blessing was it for Mary to be a witness for the resurrected Jesus Christ? 
You and I have never seen Jesus, but he says in this passage, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. If you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, say amen. Amen. Then you are his witnesses. Be his herald. The invitation is clear. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Tell someone about the incredible, life-changing power of the gospel. So we have an invitation to be healed, an invitation to hear, an invitation to be His heralds, and next, we have an invitation to harmony. Peace be with you. Three times in this passage, Jesus says, peace be with you. Here's an amazing thought. The Prince of Peace wants to give you peace. First and foremost, he wants to give you peace with God through forgiving you of your sins and reconciling you to a right relationship with the Father. But next, he wants to give you a peace that transcends all human understanding as as Philippians 4 tells us. He wants to give you peace here And forever peace by enabling you to go to heaven when you depart this earth. How many of you blame yourself for something? How many of you are living in guilt? And it's like this overwhelming weight on your life. This morning, the Holy Spirit of God and the power of Christ are inviting you to be at peace. Because some of you simply need to be at peace with yourself. Some of you have relationships that are strained. People in your life, family members, former friends, that you are no longer at peace with. Instead, you are at strife and conflict. The Prince of Peace issues you an invitation to be at peace. Will you receive it? An invitation to harmony. Dear friend, I want you to recognize something this morning that sin in our own lives takes away our peace. Troubled hearts, troubled consciences, trouble due to the consequences of sin. There's no peace to be found in this world. We find war, fear, trouble in this world. Everywhere we look, but no peace. We find peace through the invitation from the Prince of Peace. The next invitation that Jesus issues is there in verses, the last part of verse 21 and then also in verse 33. Jesus tells his disciples, uh, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, if, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. You do not, if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Here Jesus gives the invitation to receive the Holy Spirit. For those of you who have never been saved, you have an invitation to receive the Holy Spirit into your life for the for the first time. He makes you new. He changes your want to. He convicts you of sin and shows you the areas of life that need to, of your life that need to change. He also teaches you the word of God. The powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit. He comes alongside and comforts you. He does all those things. 
For those of you who are saved, but perhaps you haven't heard God's voice or understood His will in quite some time, and that's because the Bible tells us that while the Holy Spirit has indwelt you, as you are, if you are genuinely saved this morning, He can be quenched. And He's quenched by ongoing rebellion, ongoing habitual sin that's in your life that you need to be set free from today. The Holy Spirit is offered to restore, to renew, to reinvigorate. What are you in need of today? The invitation has been given. Receive the Holy Spirit. If that's indwelling for the first time, or if you just need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit in your life, the invitation is offered. Will you receive it? And then there's a powerful verse, verse 27. Here, Jesus, in in his encounter with, with Thomas, after once again saying, peace be with you, he invites Thomas to put his finger into the holes in his wrist. And then he t- invites Thomas to reach and touch the wound in his side. Have you ever wondered why the scars of Jesus that he endured on the cross were permanent? Because our salvation is permanent. God in the flesh has scars. Why? Because of his sacrifice for your sins and mine, the wounds that he received on the cross will always be there because your salvation is eternal. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And here's what he's inviting you to do. Hold on to him. You know, the Bible says that in in John, that nothing can rip us out of the Father's hand. His grip never fails, but the problem is sometimes ours does. Now, that grip is with regard to salvation. Thank God, as I've shared with you before, that your salvation does not depend on your ability to hold on to God, but His ability to hold on to you. And His grip never fails. But here in this context, what I'm talking about with hold on to Jesus is, are you following him? Are you walking in step with the will of God or have you ventured out in some direction, some detour on your own that has led you down a path of despair and disappointment, a path that leads toward destruction? There's an invitation just like the words that he said to Thomas, hold on to me again. Come back to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's that an invitation for? It's an invitation to hold on to Jesus. To embrace him. To love him the way that he loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Our faith wavers. Our faith goes up and it goes down many times due to circumstances in our life. We we see someone we love die and we wonder if there's really a God. We see someone in our life struggle with addiction and we wonder if there's really a God. Perhaps we surround ourselves with friends who Deny Christ 
And those are the voices that we choose to listen to. I want to remind you this morning that Jesus is calling you by name. And he's inviting you to hold on to him. Because he will never lead you astray. He will never lead you to destruction. But he will lead you to life and hope and peace. I ask you again. Who is it you're looking for today? And then... An invitation to hope. He tells Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Some of you are probably thinking if it were only that simple, Pastor. But James tells us that God will give wisdom when we stop asking Double-minded. That word double-minded means wishy-washy. It means means one foot in faith and one foot in the world. If you really want hope today, if you really want to be able to look forward to the tomorrow that God has for you, the invitation is being offered to take a leap into life, the resurrected life. Because those of us who try to walk in the world and try to straddle that spiritual fence, dear friend, it only leads to frustration and pain and resentment and we're constantly being pulled by the world because of temptation and because of the people that we associate with. But Jesus says, I want to invite you to life And light and hope. Will you come? This is a powerful word today. Stop doubting and believe. Ephesians 2.8 says we are saved by faith. Romans 3.24 says we are to walk by faith. Dear friend, I want to remind you that faith that breeds hope brings blessing. In this time here on earth and for all eternity. There's a big difference waking up in the morning, dreading even getting out of bed versus having the hope of Christ, waking up and saying, thank you, Lord, for a new day, a new dawn that you have given me. Thank you for the breath in my lungs. Thank you for the heartbeat in my chest. Thank you for the strength to roll out of this bed and stand up on my own two feet and walk. There's a big difference between the despair of hopelessness And the delight of hope. Which do you live in on a daily basis? God wants to bring blessing upon blessing into your life. But without faith, dear friend, it's impossible to please Him. We are saved by grace through faith. And as I've shared with you, as Brother Chris has taught in in, Bible study as well. That faith, by the way, in case you're wondering if that's a work that you create, you don't create your own faith in God. That faith is also gifted to you by the Holy Spirit. It's all given by God. The question is, will you receive the faith to hope this morning? The invitation is there, and it was all made possible because Jesus Christ rose from the dead because of the resurrection we have a great hope that we can receive by faith the hope of heaven and of eternal life and worship at the throne of our savior as we sang about this morning but also hope that you have here Because even though this world is dark and desolate and filled with sin, dear friends, you have a hope that will transform. It won't transform everyone, but it will transform you while walking among everyone. And you'll have a new perspective 
a new desire. You know, think about Mary. As she went to the tomb, weeping when she couldn't find the Lord's body, she thought she'd lost him forever. But she found out that he hadn't gone anywhere. Through the power of the resurrection and his great, amazing love. Dear friend, I want to remind you of a very important truth. Just like that little boy holding that sign on an Ocala street corner. Jesus loves you. And he's inviting you this morning. He's inviting you to be healed. He's inviting you to hear him call you by name. He's inviting you to be his herald, to be his witness. He's inviting you to harmony, to peace. He's inviting you to receive his Holy Spirit, either the indwelling that happens at the point of salvation or the fresh filling that each of us need every day as believers. He's inviting you to hold on to him. And he's inviting you to stop doubting and believe so that your faith can result in hope. I read this wonderful poem this past week and I wanted to share it with you. How do I know that Christ is risen? What proof have I to give? He rescued me from sin's dark prison and I began to live. How do I know he left the tomb that first Easter long ago? I met him at the dawn's fresh bloom and life is all aglow. How do I know he gained for me access to heaven's door? Christ's work in me is a guarantee of life forevermore. How do I know that Christ still lives rich blessings to impart, abundant grace and peace he gives, and he lives within my heart. That's hope, friends. And that's your invitation. The only question left is, will you accept the invitation of the risen Savior? Let's pray together. Lord, we love